Yes, Father, we thank you because you love us. We thank you for your grace, Father God. Your word says, Father God, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And we thank you for that, Lord, because we know that we are sinners. And we come short, Lord. We ask, Lord, that your grace might abound here the more. We pray, Lord, that today we might be able to hear from you. We pray, Lord, that you might soften our hearts today to hear from your word, to understand it, to apply it, not to forget it, but that we can bind it in our hearts, tie it around our neck. Lord, we want to pray for um, Rebecca, that you would heal her, that she might uh, feel better quickly. We pray for all those that are here today with aches and pains, yet they're here. Thank you, Lord, for them, for your uh, pers persevering saints. We pray that you just heal them, Father God. We pray for the teachers in the back. We pray for John and Tess as well. We just pray you be with them. You be with the children. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. As the youth are being dismissed, can I have you guys open your Bibles to... The book of Micah. If you know where Jonah's at, Micah's the, the next book after that. Before I begin, I want to make a few announcements. Um, the first one is uh, Sarah's back. Um, if you guys were here six months ago, uh, she uh, was. Um, she had to leave to Bahrain, you know, the the Marines uh, Center out there. Now she's back. It's been half a year already, and time went by pretty fast. Was it fast for you? No. Then it turned. Well, we're glad you're back. Um, this Sunday we're gonna have a CPR class for you, especially for you Sunday school teachers that don't have a CPR uh, certificate. Uh, please, you know, we'll have a class um, after church about 12:30. Here, so just stay here, or if you need to go out and have lunch, you can go uh, take a lunch and come back. It's all free. You'll get us certified and all that, and your certificate free of charge. That's this Sunday at 12:30. Another announcement is on Saturday we will be having the we will be broadcasting live the Harvest America. So if you guys haven't invited anybody, if you guys are planning to come, uh, remember to bring somebody. The last month, I've been going over a series titled uh, Unwavering Faith. You know, we went over uh, several uh, different books of the Bible. The topic was faith, obviously, different types of faith. Uh, but mainly, the midweek service is for the Old Testament, for um, just to go over uh, the minor prophets, the major prophets, you know, the, the books of the law, all that. So I started with Hosea, you guys remember that? We started out with Hosea, then we went on Joel, Obadiah, Amos, then Jonah, which was the last book of the minor prophets we read. Now we're in the middle. We're, this is the middle book, which is uh, Micah. There's 12 minor prophets. Now, minor not because the message is, is uh, not that important, but because generally the minor prophets, their books are not so uh, long. They're not so lengthy like uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel. That's why they're minor prophets. This book has about seven chapters. I'm probably going to spend about three Wednesdays on this book. Uh, something that's not so different than the rest of the, the prophets is basically, uh, you know, we're going to talk about judgment, we're going to talk about repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. And this is something common with, with the minor prophets. And I know sometimes we get kind of tired. Okay, okay, uh, Israel has been sinning. The Lord is going to discipline them, and then he's going to restore them again, right? We're like, well, we're back to that. How different is this than Hosea? How different is this than uh, Amos? Well, it's not that different. Yet it's another prophet. But I think it's relevant because, you see, as Christians, part of our life is to sin. You know, we're, we're, we're sinners. That's why, you know, the Bible says we're, we're sin abounds, grace abounds even more. We need God's grace. We're going to sin. We sin every day. So that's why this book is relevant to us, because we're still sinners. That's why this book is relevant to, to the world, because the world is still sinners. The world still needs restoration. It still needs Jesus Christ. I divided this book in uh, about, what is it, 
six or seven parts. We're going to go over um, two chapters today. I don't know how long the message will take. Um, just a quick recap. Uh, if you haven't been here for the series of the Minor Prophets, you have the, the kingdom of, of basically Israel, right? It's divided into two. Remember David? Remember Saul, right? When David and Saul were kings of Israel, uh, it was just called Israel. It was just one kingdom, unite, one united kingdom, right? Well, after David, after Saul, and after David, obviously, the kingdom d divided, right? So you had the two tribes on the south, which is called Judah, and then, and then the ten tribes on the north, which is called Israel. This prophet spoke to both of the kingdoms, primarily to the northern kingdom. And we know in the northern kingdom, most of the kings there, which is called Israel, they were mostly bad kings. And the southern kingdom, most of them were good, right? Not that they were righteous, but that they, they fear the Lord because they, they serve God. They, were, they didn't give over to idolatry, which is what the northern kingdom did. They built altars to Baal. They built altars to uh, Ashtoreth, to uh, Molech. Molech was this other god that, uh, that it was like a, like a small little statue. And uh, it had his hands, you know, holding out. It, they put it next to the pit, next to a, a furnace. What they would do is that they, were, they would sacrifice their, their children, babies, and, and they would put it in, uh, on the arms of this, this false god, Molech, this false idol. And, you know, it, it was a tough time. And that's why we, I wanted to give you guys this background because we might say, well, God is kind of uh, mean. He's kind of cruel to these people. And actually, you know, God has been telling him. He's been... Telling them to repent. And how does God tell, how was God telling them this? You know, he was telling them this through Amos, through Isaiah. Uh, we, even Jonah. Jonah didn't, Jonah didn't start his ministry in Nineveh, for that matter. Jonah was already a seasoned prophet. He had already preached in the northern kingdom. There is no book that talks about that. It does mention it, though, in the first or second kings that he was already a, a prophet. Yet the Lord had been sending out his prophets. His prophets had been, a lot of them have been killed. We know that because of... Uh, um, Ahab, he would uh, follow the prophets and with Jezebel, they would try to kill him. The first part I titled, uh, Micah's Calling an Audience. And we're going to see in verse 1 here that it's not too different than most of the prophets. It usually starts off something like this. The word of the Lord that came, right? And that's how Hosea was. That's how I think Amos was as well. I think Jonah says, you know, uh, God told Jonah to rise and he, God said Jonah to go and Jonah said no. Here, it's typical, it says, the word of the Lord that came uh, to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So just in verse 1, we see four things, okay? Four very important things. Uh, number one, we see the source. Number two, we see the author. Three, we see the date and the address, or the address, see the people uh, that this is referring to. The first thing is the source. What do I mean, my, I mean by that? The word of the Lord. That's the, the source, the word of God, right? He comes to, to uh, Micah here, and he gives him a vision. It's not, he didn't, it wasn't, an, I don't think it was a dream. I, I think he was awake when he saw this. But here, the Lord gives him a vision. It says, the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham. Now, Moresheth was about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem, close to the Philistine uh, country. And now it gives us the third thing, which is the date. I know you guys, you guys are not going to see the numbers other than the verse numbers there. But the way we know the date is by, by the name of the kings of the southern kingdom. When we know the name of the kings, we know around what time he was prophesying. It says, In the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. I have a, a sort of a timeline here. Um, I probably should have zoomed it a little bit more. But here we have um, the kings of the southern kingdom, which is Judah, and the kings of the northern kingdom, which is Israel. Most of these, if not all of them, are just straight out bad. They're all idolaters. They give, they give themselves over to false gods. And over here, most of them are good. Some of them not so good. I will tell you right off the bat that Ahaz was not so good of a guy. Ahaz, what he did, uh, he went to the northern kingdom. He went to uh, what was it, Damascus. He saw this idol and he liked it. So he went back home and he told one of his priests to make it a replica of it. He says duplicate it and then he brought it to Jerusalem, which is the capital there. 
and they started worshiping as well. That was not good. Now the next king after that, which is tells us in verse 1 here, after Ahaz was Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. He feared the Lord, right? He destroyed any, any idols, any false worship. He destroyed it. So we can safely say that um, Micah's uh, ministry probably lasted about 30, 35 years. I have another. Uh, you want to show the other one, Bob? Here's another timeline. <clears throat> the kings would have been around here, this, around this time. So we have uh, Jonah over here. Jonah had already gone to Nineveh with the Assyrians. Then we started off with Hosea. Then we have Amos after that. Isaiah. My, it's been said that Micah and Isaiah are very, very similar books, except Isaiah is obviously longer, right? They call Micah the mini Isaiah, just because it's seven chapters long. Not that Micah copied Isaiah or that Isaiah copied Micah, but see the Holy Spirit is given the same message at times. So we see that these guys were contemporaries. That means that they were preaching to this, around the same time. Now we see there that Isaiah, he focused on the southern kingdom, which is Israel. Jerusalem. Isaiah was a city boy. They say Micah was probably a country boy like Amos, but that's speculation. We, we don't really know because he doesn't say like Amos, I'm from the country and, uh, you know, uh, I was, you know, shepherding and the Lord just called me. He doesn't say that. We don't know if Micah was that. But we know Micah preaches to both of the kingdoms, not just the southern one. And we know, obviously, Hosea. You guys remember Hosea? He was called to, to marry a harlot or a woman that would be become uh, promiscuous, that would eventually cheat on him. Uh, then we have Amos, of course. He preached to the northern kingdom, but he was from the southern kingdom. So we see this guy. He's a little bit different. He preaches to both of the kingdoms. He's going to give about three sermons. Verse, uh, chapters 1 and 2 was the first sermon. That's why I just, I'm just going to leave it at that. His name is pretty interesting. It's like the Michael the Archangel. Micah or Mikael. El we get from God. Who is like God? Or who is like the Lord? Who is like Yahweh? Who is like Jehovah? Meaning the same thing. There is none like God. The theme is sin, judgment, repentance, and restoration as I said before. The, the kingdom that is coming is, and that's going to destroy them is the Assyrians. Remember in Jonah, the Ninevites? Uh, Jonah preached and what happened? The Ninevites repented, right? He wasn't expecting that. He didn't want the Ninevites to repent. Jonah wanted them to suffer. He wanted them to get the same treatment as Sodom and Gomorrah, to be burned with fire and brimstone. Yet that didn't happen. So this is quite some time after Nineveh repents. I don't know what happened because the Assyrians are now attacking uh, Israel. It's been said that it's going to be about 20, anywhere from 1 to 20 years after um, Micah prophesies to the northern kingdom, okay, that they get destroyed by the Assyrians. Let's continue here, verses 2 to 7, the reason for the season. This is going to tell us why God, uh, you know, what, what was wrong with them? Why God was, was angry at this? Look at verse 2. Hear all you peoples, listen, O earth, and all that is in it. So we see here that the word of God is addressed to all the world. It doesn't say, oh, hear you Israelites or, uh, or you people from Judah. No, it says, hear all you peoples, listen, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the, word, let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. Now, we're right there where it says the Lord from His holy temple, it's referring to a place of blessing. Now, this book is kind of hard because Micah is a little bit different because he has some Hebrew poetry. There's a play on words here, and I kind of don't like that because I like, you know, just straight out, yes, no, black and white, and a lot, a lot of us are like that. But there is some poetry, um, and I'll try to clarify it as I read it here. Um, but that's the difference between Micah and a lot of the other prophets. He has uh, poetry here. Yeah, it's literal, but nonetheless, he has it. It says, let the Lord God be a witness against you in verse 2. The Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. So this um, imagery that he's giving us, remember he had a vision. The Lord showed him a vision. So he's seeing God coming out of his place, right? He's seeing God sort of, uh, you know, standing up. And, and, and coming for judgment. This is a picture of judgment. It says, The Lord from His holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of His place. He will come down and tread on the high places 
of the earth. Do you guys remember ever being spanked? You know, your mom tells you or your dad, you know, I'm going to count to three. If, if you don't stop doing it, I'm going to hit you, right? Well, I remember when I was younger and uh, I thought I was too old for a spank. I thought I was too old for a belt. And um, I was probably like 13, 14. And my mom had the belt. I thought I was in a Dodger, you know. Well, she, uh, she flipped the belt around. So when I get, when I, when I did get hit, it was the belt buckle. So I had like a belt buckle mark on my stomach for about a week, you know. And, and this is what we see here. God is sitting down. He's in the place of blessing towards his people, his holy temple. And in verse 3 it says, For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. There's judgment coming now. There's a picture of judgment. So when God gets, I can safely say when God gets up and he's coming towards you, he's not going to sit back down until he finishes the job, till he disciplines you. The Bible says if you don't love your children, you're, you don't, you know, you got to discipline them. If you don't love them, you're not, you're not going to uh, discipline them. And promptly for that matter. Verse 4 says, The mountains will melt under him. Talking about God's uh, power. And the valleys will split like wax before the fire. Like waters pour down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. So now we see here, when, when the Bible says Jacob, it's referring to uh, the northern kingdom, to the Israelites. It'll, it'll use that word every now and then. It says, all this is for the transgression of Jacob, the sins of the Israelites. And for the sins of the house of Israel, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? So you're going to see something here. He's referring to the cities, the, the, the capitals. Okay, so you got the capital of uh, of Judah, which is Jerusalem, and you got the capital of, uh, of the northern kingdom, which is Samaria here. So he focuses, he's preaching against two kingdoms here, and he's focusing on the larger cities. When the Bible talks about high places, it, not, it doesn't just literally mean because both of the cities were built on, on uh, mountains, they were built on hills. It's talking about uh, places of worship, of idolatrous worship. So whenever you're in the Old Testament, New Testament, high places, don't just take it too literal. It might be talking about um, a temple of worship. It says, are they not Jerusalem in the end of verse 5? Therefore I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the field, places for planting a vineyard. I will pour down her stones into the valley, and I will uncover her foundations. So God is going to level the place down, and God, God is going to use the Assyrians to do that. Because they didn't repent. Because they didn't heed to the word of God. So he's still warning them. He's still being patient at this point. And, and this, this is probably the last, uh, the last warning he's going to give them. He's going to level the northern kingdom. And just keep in mind, if I forget, I'll, I'll tell you guys right now. But the Assyrians, they leveled the place down. They took the people. They killed the men. They took, you know, they, they made them walk miles. They shamed them. They hooked them up with the uh, hooks. Um, it was a, a, a it was a terrible time for them, but the Lord had warned them before. The Assyrians tried to do the same thing to Judah as well, but the time that they tried to do it was during the reign of Hezekiah. Remember Hezekiah? That was a good king. So the Lord was protecting the, Ju uh, the Judean kingdom during that time. The Assyrians weren't able to destroy the southern kingdom. However, the Babylonians, about 130 years later, they, they were successful during the reign of another king. Verse 4 says, The mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split like wax before the fire. God, you know, God is strong. There, there's, no, you know, there's no hiding or running from him after, after we uh, disobeyed him. Let's continue to uh, pick up where we left off. <clears throat> In the middle of uh, verse 6 here, or verse 7. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces, and all her pay as a harlot shall be burned with fire. And all her idols I will lay desolate, for she gathered it, from the pay of a harlot, and they shall return to the pay of a harlot. Now, why, why, did they, why does he feel like you have to say that word harlot over and over again? What was happening is they combined religion with sex, right? So you have uh, the prostitute, uh, the, temp the prophetess or the temple prostitutes, what they would do is they would entice men. And they would bring, hey, come worship over, come to our church, you worship by having relations. Yes, you have to pay us as well, right? So that's what they would do, right? They would get men, and uh, 
that's how they would worship God. They would combine. It was some form of syncret, uh, syncretism. They said, well, I'll, I'll be at the, the church of uh, Jerusalem this day. I'll, I'll pay my dues there. But then I'll go over here at night to uh, a false temple, right? So that's why God was going to do this. That's why God was going to destroy them. This is one of the sins that, that, that we're going to read about. There's probably about two more. But that's what they were doing. <clears throat> An article from uh, GodQuestions.org talking about uh, you know, sexual promiscuity says, the Greek word pornea is often translated sexual immorality or fornication in the New Testament. Some translations uh, consistently render pornea as fornication. In order to differentiate from adultery, the word fornication in modern English primarily carries the idea of premarital sex, sex before marriage. However, pornea does not actually refer explicitly to premarital sex. It actually refers to sexual perversion in general. Greek literature from approximately uh, the, this time period uh, used pornea to refer to prostitution, homosexuality, adultery, incest, and other sexual perversions. So we should not necessarily read premarital sex into every occurrence of the word pornea in the New Testament. The question arises then, is premarital sex considered a sexual perversion within the scope of pornea? So what's happening here is they combine sex with the religion. But today, even though these we don't have temple prostitutes out and about, don't we in the U.S., you know, in all the world, most of the countries, if not all of the world, they still practice sex before marriage, right? We've sort of desensitized our country, right? It's on the news. It's it's on TV. It's every, it's something normal. It, instead of calling it, well, I'm having, I've, I was unfaithful to my husband or my wife, right? We call it. I was having an affair, right? It sounds more, what, exotic, less sinful, right? Or, or instead of saying, uh, um, I've been fornicating, we say, well, I've just been seeing somebody, or we're trying it out, right? Revelations 2.14 says, But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So they use sex. You, know, you guys heard the term sex sells, right? Well, it happens in religion as well. They use that to build more temples, to build more idols. Let's continue here in verses uh, 8 through 16. We see the heart of a prophet. We, we're sort of changing from theme here now. Um, the difference between uh, Micah and Hosea and Amos is basically that Micah had a heart for his people. He actually cried out because he knew what was coming to them. He had a heart for the people he was preaching to. Hosea, you know, Hosea had that love too. And uh, Micah had a heart for the poor people. Remember, uh, in, uh, well, Amos had a heart for the poor people. And Amos, uh, you guys remember that chapter he calls, uh, what is it, fat cows of Bashan, right? Because they were mistreating uh, the people, the lower classes they called them. But look at verse 8. Therefore I will wail and howl. This is talking about Micah here. I will wail on how I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the jackals and a mourning like the ostriches. So you see here, he had the heart of Hosea, the heart of Amos put together, and he, he, he wanted the people to be delivered. He knew it was coming. See, he saw this. He saw this vision. So he had, maybe he had a bonus, right? He, he understood what God was going to do. Literally, he saw the Assyrian army coming most likely. What if instead of telling people, um, you know, accept Jesus or you'll be eternally separated from him? What if instead of telling people that, we told them, accept Jesus, repent of your sins and turn to Christ or else you'll go to the lake of fire for all eternity? What if we told them, I think it sounds a little bit different. I think you get a different response. You know, I think the biggest uh, evangelists out there are not here but in hell right now. Because people that are in hell, they already know what it's going to be like. They know firsthand. Uh, Micah, he knows for, firsthand because he saw it. That's why he had this passion for it. Sometimes, see, if we tell people you're going to be eternally separated from God, even though it's, it is true you are, but that's not the main thing, they, first of all, why do they care if they're going to be eternally separated if they're not trying to be close to Him at, at, right now for that matter, right? So we got we to gotta give the, the whole bad news just so they can understand, appreciate the good news. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 16 for a minute. Luke chapter 16, uh, verse 19. We're going to go over a couple verses here. It 
Now, I don't like to say things just to say them. I like to back it up with the Bible, you know. And when I say that the biggest evangelists are in hell, it's because I think the Bible says they are. Luke 16, verse 19 says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate. Verse 21 desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Verse 26, And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Now verse 27 is where we see this. Then he said, this is talking about the rich man Lazarus, who was in, in hell, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Now he has a concern for, for the, his loved ones. Verse 28, For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. He had a passion for, for, for Jesus now, or for the gospel. He had a passion to tell others about salvation. So they wouldn't have to go where he was, because he saw it firsthand. Micah saw it firsthand or secondhand because it was a vision. Yet, that's, I think that's what drove him to this. I think when, when we read this thing, what's going to happen after we die, if we don't know Jesus, if we wait to meet Jesus till after we, are, we die, it, it's too late. It's not going to be on good terms. Verse 29 says, Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. His heart was for people to repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So we see here, you know, that's why. Verse 9, For her wounds, now I'm, I'm back in uh, Micah here, Micah chapter 1, <clears throat> it says, for her wounds are incurable, for it has come to Judah. It has come to the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. Now remember, remember when I told you that Jerusalem was not going to be defeated? That's as far as the Assyrians went, went just up to the gate. They didn't go any further than that. It says, for her wounds are incurable. And it sort of tells us that the sins of the Israelites, they had gone so far that God sort of knew that they weren't going to repent. That's why he was just sending out this judgment. Not that he's there. If you, you know, confess your sins to him, he'll, he'll forgive you like that. But where it says here, her wounds are incurable is because God knows that they weren't going to turn. They were just so far, so deep, so debased in their sin that they weren't going to come back. It says, for it has come to Judah. They were infected. Now, Judah was sort of uh, starting to practice these things. It has come to the gate of my people and to Jerusalem. And now, remember, I, got, I was telling you about the poetry, about the wordplay. It's going to get kind of hard from verses 10 to 16. It's, it's kind of hard to understand, so I, I, I brought up another version so you guys can sort of get it appreciated a little bit more. But verse 10 to 16, it says, Tell it not in Gath. He's going to mention several cities. Weep not at all in beth Afra. Now, beth Afra means house of dust. Roll yourself in the dust. Pass by in naked shame, you inhabitant of Shafir. Now, the dust, uh, pe when people were mourning, they would shave their heads or they would sprinkle dust on their heads. Now, imagine somebody rolling in the dust. Now, that, that's sort of giving us an impression that they're under a lot of pain. So, he's basically telling them, roll yourself in the dust. Sprinkling some dirt on your head is not going to be enough for what's coming. The inhabitant of Sainan does not go out. Beth, e Beth Ezel mourns. Its place to stand is taken away from you. Verse 12, for the inhabitant of Maroth Pine for good, but disaster came down from the Lord to the gate of uh, Jerusalem. O inhabitant of Blackish, harness the ch chariot to the swift steeds. She was the beginning of, of sin to the daughter of Zion. For the transgressions of Israel were found in you. Verse 14, 
Therefore you shall give presents to Moresheth, Gath, the houses of Exib, shall be alive to the kings of Israel. I will yet bring an heir to you, O inhabitant of Merishah. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Make yourself bald and cut off your hair because of your precious children. Enlarge your baldness like an eagle, for they shall go from you into captivity. Now, I usually don't endorse the, the message, the, the Bible, the message, paraphrase. But this time I think they did a, a decent job in, in uh, sort of paraphrasing, giving us an appreciation for these verses. In verse 10, 15, in the message Bible, it says, 10 and 12, don't gossip about this, this in tell town. Remember those Hebrew names? It's Hebrew poetry, so we can't sort of, we can't render it in English 100% accurately. But the message puts it like this. Don't gossip about this in tell town. Don't waste your tears in dustville. Roll in the dust in al alarm town. The alarm is sounded. The citizens of Exitburg will never get out alive. Lament last stand city. There is nothing in, in you left standing. The villagers of bitter town wait in vain for sweet peace. Harsh judgment, judgment has come from God and entered peace city. All you who live in Chariotville get in your chariots for flight. You led the daughter of Zion into trusting not God but chariots. Similar sins in Israel also got their start in you. Go ahead and give your goodbye gifts to Goodbyeville. Mirage town beckoned but disappointed Israel's kings. Inheritance city has lost its inheritance. Glory town has seen its last glory. So all these cities, they're just ruins now today. You can't even find them anymore. Why? Because they were, the Assyrians came and remember God sort of leveled everything? So it's not that Micah's uh, mocking them. He's not mocking them. He's just telling them straight out. Everything's going to get leveled. And the name of your town has something to do with the destruction that you're going to get. And that's why, you know, he sort of understands it in the Hebrew better. In English, if we said something similar, I would say something like this. Um, Los Angeles, you city of lost angels. Philadelphia, city of brotherly hate. New York, a big apple with a rotten core. Chicago, windy city full of hot air. Cincinnati, sin, sin, city, right? So th this is basically what the Hebrews understand it to, to be saying. Now let's continue to the, to the second chapter here. <clears throat> In the second chapter, we're going to see uh, two, uh, two people groups. First is the leaders, the rich people, and then it's the false prophets. Verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. At morning light they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and take them by violence, also houses and seize them. So they oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. So what do we see here? We see, first we saw idolatry uh, with, uh, with, you know, have, combining sex and religion. And then we saw, we see here now covetousness. They were covetous, they were greedy. It's basically telling us in verse 1 that they, instead of going to bed when it's time to go to bed, they're just planning how they're going to scheme somebody the next day. They're sort of playing a monopoly for real. You know, they, they already have boardwalk and they want, you know, what the cheaper real estates, you know, whatever, Baltic Avenue. <clears throat> Colossians 3.5 says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. And that's interesting because it says, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So Paul sort of combines these things and he basically says covetousness is very interrelated to idolatry. And isn't this what they were doing? Spiritual idolatry? Jeremiah 6.13 says, From the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They were trying to just gain, gain, gain some more. They were oppressing the, the poor. I have a little, a little short story here, or a little bit short. It says, uh, a boat docked in a tiny Mexican village. An American tourist complimented the Mexican fisherman on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took him to catch them. The Mexican said, not very long. Well then, why didn't you stay out longer and catch up more? Asked the American. The Mexican explained that his small catch was sufficient to meet his needs and those of his family. The tourist said, but what do you do with the rest of your time? I sleep late, fish a little, play with my children, and take a siesta with my wife. In the evenings, I go into the village to see my friends and play guitar and sing a few songs. I have a full life. The tourist interrupted, 
I have an MBA from Harvard and I can help you. You should start by fishing longer every day. You can then sell the extra fish you catch. With the extra revenue, you can buy a bigger boat. With the extra money, the larger boat will bring, uh, you will bring a larger boat. You can buy a second one and a third one and so on until you have an entire fleet. Instead of selling your fish to the middleman, you can negotiate directly uh, with the plants and maybe even open your own plant. You can then leave, leave this little village, move to Mexico City, LA, New York. <clears throat> the Mexican said, how long would that take? The tourist answered, 20, perhaps 25 years. And after that, replied the Mexican, well, that's when it gets really interesting. He answered laughing, when your business gets really big, you can start selling stocks and make millions. Really? And after that, replied the Mexican, well, after that, you'll be able to retire, live in a tiny village near the coast, sleep late, play with your children, catch a few fish, take siestas with your wife, and spend your evenings drinking and enjoying with your friends. You know? And, and you know, it's funny because it's true. You know, we, we work hard just to get, what, when you turn 60, 65, to retire and, and enjoy, you know, if the Lord allows you to live that long. Enjoy what? You know, we need to enjoy life now. And I mean that in... in uh, in a conservative way, right? Let's continue. Verse 3, Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks, nor shall you walk haughtily, for this is an evil time. In that day one shall take a proverb against you and lament with a bitter lamentation, saying, We are utterly destroyed. He has changed the heritage of my people, how he has removed it from me. To a turncoat he has divided our fields. Therefore, you will have no one to determine boundaries by law in the assembly of the Lord. The Living Bible renders verses 4 and 5 like this. Then your enemies will taunt you and mock you, uh, your uh, dirge of despair. We are finished, ruined. God has confisc confiscated our land and sent us far away. He has given us what is ours to others. Others will set our boundaries. Then the people of the Lord will live there, will live where they are sent. So you see these guys, the rich people from the north, they were stealing from other people. They were ripping off the widows. They were ripping off the veterans. They were ripping off the, the orphans. And now they themselves were going were gonna to be ripped off. And they were going to be property themselves because they were going to be taken away because of what they did. But isn't sin like that? When we you know, give in to covetousness, when we give in to uh, any sin for that matter, it's going to enslave us. If that's what we put before the Lord, it's going to enslave us. Whatever sin it is, it will enslave you, and it wants to make you the property. To finish up here, verses 6 through 11, woe to the prophets. He speaks to the rich people, to the leaders. Now he speaks to the prophets. It says, do not prattle, you say, to those who prophesy, so they shall not prophesy to you. They shall not return Insult for insult. I like how the NIV renders this. Do not prophesy. Their prophets say. So basically you got, you know, the rich people, uh, the people from the north, they had their own prophets. They had gathered their own prophets. The prophets that stuck around that weren't killed, they were the ones that were lying to them. They were lying prophets. They were false prophets. Paul tells us of these. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 3-4 says, For the time will come, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So, you can assume that their messages had nothing to do with repentance, had nothing to do with turning to God. It was more about, you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. Continue in what you do. And that's the people they surrounded themselves with, right? Right? They paid him off. They were um, hirelings. Jerry Falwell says, People will always seek a preacher that will console them rather than convict them of sin. Verse 7, You who are named the house of Jacob, is the Spirit of the Lord restricted? Here we see the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, just in, in verse 7. It says, Is the Spirit of the Lord restricted? Basically saying, okay, you got God's prophets here. Those that are going to preach the gospel are going to preach the gospel. That's how God spoke. He, he sort of uh, uses whole, the Holy Spirit to, to speak to these people. Some penned down what they wrote, others vocalized it. Yet, God uses the Spirit. 
to speak to people. Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to, to him who walks uprightly? And that's just so powerful. If you, you know, just meditate on this. Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? It's been said that the Bible will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from the Bible. So hold on to your Bible. You know, use it. You know, use it and abuse it. It's better if your Bible's torn up than your life, right? I like what Psalm 119, 105 says. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, right? And when we have the Bible, I'm not talking about in, in your desktop or, or in the middle of your living room with, you know, gathering dust. I'm talking about carrying your Bible with you, whether it's an app on your phone or an actual book. Carry it with you, you know, meditating on it day and night. And that's why we can learn to appreciate what verse 7b says, do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly. He's basically saying, look, if you're following my words, you don't need to worry if you're hearing what I'm telling you. So here, if you're here tonight, this message might not necessarily apply to you, but you know somebody that it dies, then give him this message. You know, turn to the Lord before it's too late. Verse 8 says, Lately my people have risen up as an enemy. You pull off the robe with the garment from those who trust you as they pass by like men return from war. Remember I was telling you about the veterans? Well, here in verse 8 it tells us they basically take their last coat. All they have to keep them warm, they even took that from them. It says like men return from war. They take their last garment there, their robe. Verse 9, The woman of my people you cast out from their pleasant houses. From their children you have taken away my glory forever. They had no mercy even on the widows. They might have, uh, their, their husbands might have died at war. They might have inherited a home. And then, you know, the, the greedy people come and they take their, home, their homes and they leave them in the streets. Verse 10 says, Arise and depart, for this is not your rest, because it is defiled. It shall destroy, yes, with utter, utter destruction. If a man should walk in a false spirit and speak a lie, saying, I will prophesy to you, of wine and drink, even he would be a, pr a prattler of this temple. The Living Bible renders this verse, I'll preach to you the joys of wine and drink, that this is the kind of drunken lying prophet that you like. So the prophets were kind of telling them it was okay to drink. Sir, drink up, right? As long as you're paying me. Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. I think I can safely say, don't focus on what the world can give you. Focus on what the Lord can give you, right? Be filled with, be filled in the spiritual, not on the natural, right? Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And, and verse 12 to 13, these two verses are where God, where the Lord just focuses on restoration. He gives them, he gives them the reason for their, why he's going to judge them, and he tells them that he's going to judge them, right? He sort of names out their sins, but... Like I said, you know, where there's sin, there's grace that bounds even more. God has this part for them. So here we see the light at the end of the tunnel in verse 12, 13. To finish up. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of the pasture. They shall make a loud noise because of so many people. And here's a messianic prophecy, verse 13. The one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. What is this talking about? Who is the breaker? And I'm not talking about a, a dancer, you know. The breaker here is Jesus. It says again, verse 13, The one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass by them, pass before them with the Lord at their head. The people were to be restored, and to this day we're still waiting for Israel to come back to the Lord. And, and it, it'll be soon. It'll be soon. Yet, because Micah's prophecy of destruction happened, we can go back and we know the Assyrians destroyed uh, Israel. What was it, 722 B.C., I think it was? He prophesied that. He also prophesied that they would come back, right? The remnant here, the Israelites, with their king, the breaker, but well, we're still waiting on that. This prophecy is still to be fulfilled. And that ends today's message. We saw something typical of the prophets, yet every time there really is a little bit, a little bit of a difference, um, yet Micah has more to offer than just these two, two
two chapters. You know, chapter uh, chapters three to seven will have similar tones and prof. Uh, uh, what is it? Poetry and prophecies. Yet God still speaks to us through every tittle, through every word. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for <clears throat> what you do in our lives. We thank you for the grace that you give us. Father, we thank you for the families that we have. Lord, help us to spend time with them. Help us to pour into them. Help us to pour into them your word. Help us to pray with them. Help us to just reach out the lost. Help us to be like Micah. Help us to have a passion for the lost. Lord, bring about um, divine appointments that we may be like you were with the woman on the well. That you brought a natural conversation about water and you made it into a supernatural one about living water. Lord, give us these opportunities and help us walk in, in them, Father God. Help us to worship you now in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.